This didactic lecture is on Ultrasound Basics, Part 1. We will be discussing some things about probes as well as basic artifacts and a little bit of a history about ultrasound in general. So first, first ultrasound started through a water bath medium and you can see the bulkiness of this uh, article from Life Magazine 1954. It's not as portable as today and much harder to use. Here you see something from about 15, 20 years ago, and you can see as it is getting more portable and smaller, it would still be very difficult to take this to the bedside and use it as a uh, tool to make decisions on patients that are critically sick. A brief history, it was first developed from principles of sonar in World War I. In 1947, the first sonographic images of a human skull were taken. Then in 1958, <coughs> images of abdominal disease were published. Very soon, cardiology, radiology, obstet obstetrics opened arms over the next several decades. And now due to better imaging and more portable equipment, various specialties have opened their arms to this modality. Even psychiatry, you see here, uh, this article says reproducibility and diagnostic accuracy of sonography for the diagnosis in Parkinson's disease. So you can see it's having a lot more wide, widely applicable uses. For us, ultrasound in the present, the machines are a lot more compact, they're higher in quality, they're less expensive, definitely more available, obviously less radiation exposure than CAT scan or other modalities we use. And I think one of the most important parts for us in critical care and emergency medicine is reproducibility. In the future, who knows what ultrasound will offer us, as there are diagnostic ultrasound as well as therapeutic ultrasound modalities. First, critical care ultrasound is a new discipline. It's not the same ultrasound that you see in radiology, cardiology, or even emergency medicine. First, new applications have to be adapted to use in the critical care setting with certain critical care problems we have, such as hypotension, oligoanuria, the trauma setting. Uh, old applications with a point of care focus is, is what we're aiming towards. But critical care ultrasound is also a real-time discipline in that a lot of our decisions that we are making, we use ultrasound kind of as a crutch to help make our, our decisions. And with it, we provide better patient care. So who owns ultrasound? Really, no one technically owns ultrasound. It can be used as a tool such as a stethoscope, a um, tuning fork that you see on the right, or a bougie that anesthesiology uses. But what we need to be is trained in ultrasound, and that's the whole point of this curriculum, is to help students, residents, faculty be more trained in a modality that can help take better care of their own patients. <laughs> so what are the questions? We used to ask more system-based questions, such as FAST, a typical example is FAST, where it was called Focused Abdominal Sonography and Trauma, whereas now we're focusing more on problem-based approaches of ultrasound, as, as in FAST, it's changed to focus assessment with sonography in trauma, with trauma being the problem. And now you see many articles coming out with the problem of hypotension, hypoxia, oligoanuria, and other common conditions we see in the ICU that can be assisted with the use of ultrasound. Also, we, we know in almost every major critically ill sickness, whether it's sepsis, hypotension, cardiogenic shock, their pulmonary embolism, there's golden hour. Generally, what we used to do, we used to have a problem. We would order the ultrasound. The tech would do the ultrasound. Someone would read it, and then they would get back to you, and then you would make a treatment plan. What we're trying to do here is use, not, not replace that, but do a modality called point-of-care ultrasound, which actually makes the decision at the bedside with the clinician taking care of the patient. I know this sounds simple, but with this basics, 
we really just need to understand the basics of an ultrasound machine. Every machine is a little bit different, but they have a, a few common buttons. For instance, the first one is a switch on button. I know this sounds a little ridiculous, but some machines are difficult to find this button. And the better you get with the machine that you will be using for your patients, uh, it will make it more applicable, applicable in the setting that you want. The gain setting uh, is important, which is how bright the image is, which we'll talk about a little bit more in more detail. We also have, most of these machines have a button called Optimize, which will kind of optimize the screen for you. The Image Depth button, this is something that you will frequently change depending on what kind of structure you're looking at, whether it's a superficial vascular structure or if you're looking for depth with a pleural effusion or some intra-abdominal organs. The M mode is for demonstrating dynamic questions, is motion mode, which we'll talk about in a few slides later. And the freeze button, critical care ultrasound is a real-time discipline, so we don't really need to use the freeze button as much as the save button for saving clips for future review. But the freeze button does allow you to uh, freeze the particular image and review uh, usually a, a 30, 15 to 30 second clip before uh, you froze it. We do have spatial learning. The sonographer obtains images and also makes the bedside clinician. So instead of just being able to read the ultrasound image, you would have to get good with your hand-eye coordination and be able to understand how movements of your hand affect the images that you see on the screen. In general, the upper part of the screen is a superficial part of the patient's body. The lower part of the screen is the deep part of the patient's body. The left and right depend on the probe marker icon. It's reversed in echocardiography versus other body ultrasounds. The probe marker in critical care should always be to the patient's right or the patient's cephalad or head position. A few things about probes, they function under an effect called the piezoelectric effect, which essentially the probes are made of a very small crystals, and these crystals deform uh, based on the ultrasound wave that gets sent and comes back, and based on that, an image is displayed on the screen. Obviously, it's a lot more complex than what I make it seem here, but the main thing you need to understand is that each of these probes uh, function under the piezoelectric effect. A few things about the probe. There's two usually major probes. The first one is on the left is called a linear array or a vascular probe. These typically have higher frequencies and because of that they have improved resolution but not a, an increased depth, depth that you can see. So these kind of probes are used for looking at superficial structures such as veins and arteries as well as for vascular access. The probe on the right, the two probes you see, are a abdominal and a phased array, or convex probe. These probes can differ in the size of their footprint, which is the gray portion that you see, uh, and they can differ in the angle that it makes. For instance, the probe all the way to the right is called an abdomen probe, obviously used for structures in the abdomen, such as kidneys, aortas, uh, deeper structures in general. The one to the left of it is called a phase array or cardiac probe. And these can be used to get into tighter spaces between ribs and to look at the heart, for instance. The main difference between the linear array probe and these abdominal or phase array type probes is in the abdomen, their improved frame rates. So this improves the uh, motion, such as mitral valve, or if you're trying to look for movement of uh, Doppler, these are better. How to hold the probe? I know this seems also simple, but when you first start out, you tend to hold the probe in a manner that makes it stressful on your hand. So you should really hold it kind of like a pen. It will help you decrease your fatigue. It will minimize the pressure that you have to place, and that's important when you're evaluating vascular structures. 
the operator's hand must remain still, especially with dynamic evaluations. So this helps with that. Also, don't hold the probe too tight. That can fatigue you. Essentially, another person should be able to withdraw it from your grip fairly easily. Here's some images of improper placement. Usually when I see beginners using a probe, they start with the bottom right. And uh, this works for about 15, 20, 30 seconds, but if you have to do long, longer exams, this tends to make it harder for you to control. Also, it's hard for you to control the images and get the, the best image. So the one to the top left is probably the best way to hold it. A few terminology on movements. Um, one of the movements is called fanning. Uh, there's a variant of this called the Carmen maneuver, which causes, which uses the gliding of the skin over the underskin. There's rotation, which is clockwise or counterclockwise, and there's sliding, where you actually just move the hand, uh, kind of like moving, changing the gear on a car. You, you actually just moving the the probe. What do you do with your second hand? You should always position your unit on the side that you are on so that you can use your second hand to make adjustments. That's another thing I do see beginners make is they put the ultrasound probe ultrasound on one side and have the probe with them on the other side. And they assume somebody else will do all the saving, freezing. And sometimes they do that because it, it feels more convenient because you're closer to the side that you're trying to evaluate. But you really need to get better at situation, situating the machine closer to you. You can also use your hand to lift the patient or bed down for posterior lung analysis. Also to use more jelly uh, for the next part of the body to scan. So let's talk a little bit about understanding the composition of an image. The gain is a term you will hear, hear very frequently. It traditionally uses the liver and gallbladder to set the liver is actually called hepatization, and a lot of structures that resemble liver will, will be called hepatization. Also, it's one of the first things ultrasounded, so you will frequently see that as used as kind of like the, the template for what kind of gain you're going to use. We're going to go through the basic glossary, all the echoics you might have heard in the past, hyperechoic, hypoechoic. We're going to have a few slides on artifacts and uh, probe types. So understanding composition of image, the gain, again, traditionally uses the liver and gallbladder to set. Maybe you've seen ultrasound in the past where it was too bright. That's called too much gain. Uh, maybe you've seen it where it's too dark. That's called too less gain. What you see here in the middle is probably what's optimal for liver and kidney. And again, it takes you have to do a few of them to kind of understand what optimal gain is. Also at the beginning you can, in most of these new machines, have a button called optimize and you can use that optimize button to uh, determine what's what's good and kind of get a general sense. There are echoics, there's a basic glossary. Uh, hypoechoic is generally black or anechoic is black and is affiliated with things like fluid, or blood, or fat. Hyperechoic are structures that are bright white and generally occur in bone or pericardium, uh, things like that. Air does not, pour, does not propagate ultrasound well. The waves are often scattered. It does not show up as black. It actually doesn't even really show up. So up well. Artifacts you can have due to the body habit is, due to the procedure itself, for instance, if you cause fluid pockets or needles and stuff like that, leads to appearance of structures that are actually not there. Below you see a few of the types of artifacts, acoustic shadowing, reverberation, refraction, mirror images, and posterior acoustic enhancement. We're going to go through some of this stuff to look in more detail. So for instance, the first thing called acoustic shadowing, you generally see with ribs, bones, and gallstones. And you see here on the left, you see an image with a bright black 
shadow kind of behind it. That's usually due to a bright structure, such as a gallstone, right anterior to it. On the right, you see it, uh, essentially two rib shadows, and the, they are occurred because of the, the bone, causing shadow behind it. Reverberation artifacts are things such as like A lines, comet tails, and B lines. You're going to learn all these, what they actually are in other modules, but essentially uh, they cause a kind of a repeat of that image. If you look on the right, you see a bright white pericardium, and then the two arrows you see are actually artifacts, not are not actual structures. Refraction can be seen in many areas, but one of them is over here you see is aortic duplication due to the refraction artifact. Um, and you can see that uh, because the white arrows are showing you uh, similar images of the aorta. Over here you see mirror images of the liver, usually the liver, the heart, usually due to hyperechoic structures like the diaphragm or pericardium. Um, you can see here on the kind of drawing on the left, you see R. That would typically be like the bright white structure, which is a diaphragm or a pericardium. One way to get rid of these mirror images is to move your probe around in different locations, and usually the structure disappears. Posterior acoustic enhancement is where you see like hyper echoic structures behind, usually dark anechoic circular structures, such as a cyst or bladder. The different type of modes we have are called A mode, B mode, M mode, Doppler mode, or color Doppler and power Doppler. A modes is, was one of the first ones ultrasounds used. We don't see that on machines anymore. They're called amplitude mode. It used to, when first ultrasound started, in, like in that water bath medium, you saw at the beginning, you would just get a graph. B mode was first called bright mode because that was when first um, you were able to actually see an image. M mode is called motion mode. Essentially, it takes six second or whatever you decide clip of a particular line segment. The D mode or Doppler mode obviously uh, you take uses flow to determine um, Doppler, and we'll talk about that in a few slides in the next section. And the power Doppler mode detects motion essentially of like usually low velocity fluids. So like for instance the dynamic dimension of the M mode you can use to determine like uh, effusions, mitral valve movements, um, and you can actually, in, for instance in this picture, the bright white line is the sector, particular sector that you're analyzing. And you can see on the bottom the six second clip that it produces. Where you see the M in the picture is actually the mitral valve moving. So you, you could use that to kind of gather information about the actual movement of the mitral valve and determine velocities and function, left ventricular function, and things like that. A few things about gel, um, you know, use as much gel that's appropriate. You don't have to use too much gel to do a lot of the views that we're going to get. And you see on the bottom right, uh, the person's not using any gel. So you need to be somewhere in the middle between these two. The room and the lights, an ultrasound tech once told me that he can tell who the ex experts from the beginners are just by walking in the room. Usually the experts dim or turn down the shades. I find this very useful. It definitely image, uh, If you get in the pattern of doing it, you'll improve your image quality and your interpretation. A few impediments to ultrasound exam. Uh, the ribs and the gas are pretty much the biggest ones. For gas, abdominal, like colon gas, try shifting with your second hand. Sometimes you can sh shift, uh, you know, move the abdomen the, around or slow and steady pressure. The ribs, you can use rotation of the probe or you can slide between the ribs to slide between the ribs. 
sometimes obese patients can be difficult to view, although it's not always the case, so you should always try. In our surgical ICU, patients with extensive dressings, drains, or wounds can also be a problem. Specific problems we have in critical care are like positioning of the patient usually has to remain supine, so you can't move the patient to the left lateral decubitus to improve your view of your heart or have them sitting up so you can improve your view of the pleural effusions. Many different pieces of equipment are around the ventilator, around the patient, such as the ventilator, the dialysis, IV poles, and you have to get used to functioning around these things. Uh, some of the strengths, you can actually increase the tidal volume to improve abdomen views, or and uh, if we're using TPN, it can actually decrease bowel gas. So these kind of things help us out, but they're kind of hard to adjust real time. Remember, cleaning the equipment is a very important part. Uh, you must do to prevent infection spread. There have been many hospitals with cases of spread of infection through the ultrasound machine where they've had to close down particular units because of that. And so, and so it's not only good for the hospital, but good for patient care to not have to do that. And um, so you must clean your um, machines. A little bit more on cleaning here at University of Florida. You should not be using the chloral wipes, which are orange, or the purple wipes. You have you should be using the red wipes, the the ones with the red uh, container color are the most appropriate for cleaning the ultrasound machines. The purple ones can cause uh, injury to the probes uh, and degrade the plastic material on top of the probes, which would uh, cause a problem. You can also use alcohol sprays on the machine, uh, especially one we have for ultra machine and clean the small hand towels. Uh, we do have closed areas on ultrasound carts sometimes so that uh, you can uh, use those cleaning materials in there. Uh, clean from the probe all the way down the cord. Many times I see blood or other material on the cord that should never uh, be left alone. That should always be clean after you use it. Uh, you should not have the probe cords hanging on the floor. There are hooks on the machines to place them. This is very important for multiple reasons, so make sure you do this every time you use an ultrasound machine. So to end this uh, didactic lecture, how do you get better? Uh, as through this curriculum, you're going to continue reading literature. Uh, your, your familiarity with your own field, for instance, anesthesia, pain management, internal medicine, re, uh, nephrologist, whatever your field is, if you get better in your own field, it'll help you understand the, why you use an ultrasound more and more. And just like any other procedure, practice is, is the most important. And that's the goal of this curriculum, especially with the active parts of the learning, is to get more and more practice. No matter how much lecture you listen to or uh, reading material you do, until you take the probe and go to the patient's bedside, uh, you're not going to get much better. And um, so hopefully we'll facilitate a way for you to get better throughout your training period.